All right, we are live. Welcome back. Welcome in the future <clears throat> to another P5 Live sessions. Uh, improv, an hour of play within P5 Live. We don't know where we'll go, although tonight we're going to first check out something fun to announce. P5 Live has a new version that just got launched today, 1.3.4. Um, all kinds of new stuff got dropped in, fixed, that will hopefully make your use with P5 Live that much smoother, will make it that much more relevant, helpful if you're teaching P5, especially in a remote teaching context. So I think I want to kick off uh, this evening walking you through a couple of the new features, and then we're going to play with one of them for a while, because it's a weird kind of hacky thing. Um that was initially meant for teaching, but it has all kinds of possibilities for fun, creative coding use. So we'll get into that afterwards. But I think I want to start out by just walking you through things that changed. Um, if you've been using P5 before, P5 Live before, one of the first things you'll notice is uh, the export changed. And that is now a, like a context menu that opens up the usual snapshot or HTML export. And uh, there are fun additional buttons that are going to be arriving here that are in the works. I think I'm, I think a next big feature I wanna work on is history, the ability to record the history of everything you type, and then you could almost play it back kind of like a player piano. Uh, so that'll be coming hopefully soon as a next update. <clears throat> Something that got fixed in the exporting a snapshot, when you click that button, it exports both a snapshot of what we see and your actual code. And I fixed the timestamp on that. So now they have the exact same timestamp. So it's really easily, really easy to check your downloads and see a screenshot as well as the exact code that belongs to that screenshot. So it's a really nice way to like archive while you're working if you change stuff uh, to regularly press control S and take screenshots, snapshots of your code. So this is something that's changed, just kind of opens and closes. There is this fun thing called the chalkboard, which is the last thing I'll get into. So I'm gonna wait off on that. Um, I'm gonna to go to the settings because there's a few new things to check out in the settings. Mainly uh, a couple of new features. There is backup co-coding. Um, this is hot, hot off the press. And what this is, is once in a while, I need to restart the co-coding server. If I'm updating or I don't know, for whatever reason, if it crashes, there was, I found a little bug, uh, that if someone left and for some reason their cursor didn't update, it could cause the server to crash. It happened once in a while. Uh, co-coding is a super volatile space. What is co-coding? It's this button here that lets you code collaboratively with anyone, either locally or online. And it's a volatile space. I see it like a sandbox. I don't, um, yeah, I don't know. I use it. It's super fun to collaborate with people. There's all kinds of fun features that I can also get into in this series, but it's a volatile space. So if the server goes, if it restarts or something happens, uh, this button should hopefully automatically save your code if it loses a connection to the server <clears throat> because what's happening here, co-coding is based on web sockets. And so uh, that's using socket.io as a library. And if the connection ever drops between your co-coding session and that socket.io, then it will automatically quickly save. If I go to my sketches, maybe I can see one. Do, do, do. Nope, I don't see one. I can show you what this looks like. If I open up a co-code, here I am in a co-code, I was testing a long name, I'll just say, this is P5 Live Sessions. So if I'm coding something and I make something awesome, like in lips that has a random width, random height, and is random five to 50. So we're just making stars all over the place. Uh, we can always clone our sketch just by clicking this button. And what that does is it lets us clone as we're coding with people multiple times. We can just sort of keep track of what the code was while we were working together. So I'm always telling students, press this button 
make sure you don't lose the code because I see this again as a super volatile space. Uh, let me add a background that is kind of fading out to get this to fade away. So what this special feature will do is if it ever loses the connection, syncing everyone together, then it will just quickly press that backup button, this little clone button, and it will tell you, hey, I backed it up just to be safe. So this is a useful feature just so that you don't lose stuff in this volatile space. Another thing on the backup, this was a long requested feature by students, was to back up the whole P5 Live. Um, because I warn everyone in the about that P5 Live is only storing stuff inside of your browser's local storage. I'm not using a cloud or anything. It's really um, just on your computer, especially so that it works offline. Like right now, I'm working with the, if I get out of full screen, I'm working in the offline version because it just works faster. I have my local assets, etc. And what is fancy about this is now I can say, hey, backup P5 Live either every time I exit, so every time you refresh the browser or close the browser, it will save all your sketches, all your settings. You could have it do it once a day, once a week, once a month. <clears throat> uh, basically, it'll just check, hey, are you closing the browser? And it's been a day since I last backed up. Then it would back up. And... Um, if you are using the fancy offline server with Node.js, then it goes into the P5 Live folder. It's able to write it to that folder and puts it in a place called backups. So it's nice and neat. Uh, you have just the, the place for backups. If you are online or using a Python server, then it will just download the file. So if I click now, I don't see it because I'm using the fancy server, but it's there. Uh, I'm not going to prove it's there, but it's there. And this is also a way that on demand, you could say, hey, I want to back up P5 Live. So it's really good to set this either on daily or weekly, because in the past, there has been an update to Chrome that killed the local storage. I had students lose some work, or maybe you are deciding to clear your cache every once in a while. Uh, this can be a great way to back everything up. Then what happens, so I just backed it up. What I'm going to do is try to import it. So I'm going to exit co-coding. We don't need to co-code now. There are a couple other updates to co-code, but there are details that you can look at on GitHub. So what I'm going to do is go to my P5 Live. Here's where my backups arrived. And this is the latest backup I just made. I'm going to say open. And it tells me, hey, I found your backup. Do you want to import the settings only? I could turn that on or off. Uh, do you want to import your sketches? I have 800 something sketches. Or I turn that off and say, I just want my settings back. Uh, or you can say, skip the duplicates. And then it hides those. And somehow these are ones that it thinks are okay to import. Yeah, so this can be a really nice feature just for, um, especially if you're switching browsers. Because again, P5 Live is based on domain name, port, and HTTP, HTTPS. So if you're using the online version and you want to go to offline, it's good just to say back it up and then uh, import all your assets to the offline version. Okay, so backing up is a thing and that's hopefully going to save you from any loss of data. The next thing there was, auto oh, inside of the settings as well. This was a feature since like P5 Live first came out, there was interest for alternative key bindings. So the editor I'm using is called Ace Editor, and I really like just the default things that it has. I can select a bunch of lines of code and turn them on and off. But there are some people out there who use maybe special editors from terminal times, um, namely Vim or Emacs. If you learn those, I'm sure that's the only thing you want to use. It's a really special kind of key binding, and I bet when you know it, you're super uh, efficient. I don't know it, so I never used it, but I figured out how to hot swap these key bindings. And so now you have the ability to switch to Sublime key bindings or uh, Visual Studio Code or Vim or Emacs. By default, it's on Ace. That way it's like the most compatible with this editor. But if you're into those things or you're using one of those tools a lot, you may wanna switch the key bindings to, to be even faster. Another new feature is the ability to load a sketch by URL. 
And I figured this would be kind of interesting because if I go out of full screen mode, uh, we can do fun things like we can say, and edit equals zero. And what that does is it loads the sketch without any of the interface options. I don't have the menu, I don't have the code. <clears throat> and this was really useful if you wanted to share something like maybe a co-coding session with some people and they shouldn't code, they should just see what you're coding. So you could just put this and edit equals zero, and then you just have the, the visuals happening. It's especially interesting. You can change it to a one to be how it actually is, but maybe it's nice if I have an ellipse that's following my mouse and I'll let it be 150. So this thing is moving around. Then I say zero, everything is gone. And now I have this kind of fun interactive place which could be nice for maybe an installation if it's using the camera or doing data visualization on its own or so. But what could be tricky is if you want to load a specific sketch, because maybe you install P5 Live on a Raspberry Pi and you're interested to like load what is a particular sketch I want, like, uh, let me see this OBJ vertices. So I have this teapot and I want this as my installation or maybe something else like a smooth sign worm. This is interesting. So maybe this was supposed to be an installation and I want it to for sure load this sketch on my Raspberry Pi or whatever. What I can do now is add a parameter called sketch equals and then you type it in exactly like it is there. So I can say smooth sign worm. It loaded the smooth sign worm, but I'm going to copy that and change sketches. So I'm going to go to like this teaser I made for this version of P5 Live. So I'm on this totally other sketch. If when I refresh the page, now it goes to this smooth sign worm because it's saying, hey, for sure load that sketch. And then if this was an installation, I would maybe also say edit zero and it loads that sketch without any of the interface on it. So this could be a really interesting thing if you, if you, yeah, design stuff with P5 and you wanna, I haven't tested it out on a Raspberry Pi, but I'm optimistic the browser is working well or or maybe just some, some laptop hooked up um, to a screen. Who knows what, but now you can do it. So let me get rid of all of that and go back to just P5 Live. A huge new feature. Uh, one of the, the biggest issues while teaching people to code, I'm going to make the code bigger, is running into infinite loops. This is something that happens all the time. So I'm going to make a nice background. I'm going to have my, actually, I'm just going to go to my previous sketch with my dots happening. Let's go back one. Okay, we just have random dots happening. Maybe I do want that background that's fading out. Um, let's see. Yeah, let me make a quick loop and I'll show you where people hit infinite loops all the time. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to turn off that ellipse. We're just going to have a background that's on totally. And I'm going to say four, let I equal zero. I is less than, let's have 25 of these things. I plus plus. And let's, uh, distribute them across the page. So I comes in, it goes from zero to 24. I want it to go from zero to the width. And let's make these things a little bigger. Okay, so we're doing a basic loop. I'm gonna go back to full screen. Uh, so I have a basic loop here. It's maybe really good to make this a variable so I could easily map it and be flexible. It's the exact same, but now I could say I want 250 of these things or five of these things. And what tends to happen all the time is while you're building this loop, you screw up somehow. Uh, maybe this is not a greater than or less than, or maybe you are skipping every so many. So if I was counting 50 of these things and I said plus equals one, plus equals five, and now they're five apart. And then you screw up and say plus equals zero. What that would do if I ran this is create an infinite loop where I starts at zero. It's supposed to quit once 
it gets to B, L, C, it can never get there because it grows by zero. And I press enter. And if I look at my console, it says infinite loop, check the code, recompile. So before you would totally crash and you'd have to uh, type in, whoops. Before I had a little feature where you could say like hashtag bug, and then that would bring up the code and you could fix your error and say, ah, oh, it should be a one save and then it would fix it but luckily now um let me force this to compile we get this error that says like go fix your stuff and then you say fine fine and you figure out what the problem is and you recompile and you're back this is something that's on yeah most editors online and finally it's part of p5 live as well this also works for <clears throat> Maybe if you forget to type this thing in, if you just do this part, it's it's not working, but at least it didn't actually freeze. I can bring it back. Or if I do a while loop and say while true, that also freaks out and says, no, 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 you can't do that. So I can bring it back. Um, this was also a really easy way to kill a co-coding session if someone accidentally, while typing a loop, broke the loop, uh, it would just kill the session for everyone that's in the room. And that's why by default, P5 Live doesn't compile when you are on a for loop. Like if I'm changing the numbers here and I say uh, equals 10, it's not gonna compile unless I do control, shift, enter, and do a forced hard compile. Then I can do it. Otherwise you have to go down one line and then it's like, okay, I'll try to recompile that line. So if I go here and say return, then it does it. It was just to be safe so people couldn't hit infinite loops while they typed, but now it's great that um, you have one second that the loop is allowed to run. I'll put this back on a normal loop. You either have one second that it's allowed to run or 10,000 iterations, and then it's like, bam, I'm broken. So let me show the console again. I'll clear it and I can demonstrate uh, how you can also bypass it. It's the same way a lot of tools use. If I said I want 10,000 of these things, I am allowed to do it, but it got super slow. Okay, it got super slow. It wasn't so slow when I was testing this before, maybe because I have a map in there. Let me turn that off and just say, uh, let x equal i times 10. Uh, maybe because it was actually drawing everything on screen. Yeah, so this is really dumb. You don't want to do 10,000 of something, but you can. So I'm doing 10,000. Now it's okay because most of them are off screen. And if I say 10,001, let me clear this. And I say 10,001, and it freaks out and says, no, 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 you broke an infinite loop. And I say, damn, but I really wanted 10,002 things. If that's the case, then you just have to say no protect somewhere in your code, and now you're allowed to do it. It's it's like shutting up and um, not protecting you anymore. You can have spaces or whatever. You just have to write no protect. And this is what a number of tools use. Um, I'm not using a tool called loop protect. I'm using something called loop breaker. You can learn about at the very bottom of the about is like all the tools that I've used to make P5 Live. And there you can find the repo for this loop breaker and how it's working. I tested a few and it was working really well. Uh, but I don't want this because I really should break if I have such a huge loop that's out of control. So luckily it just kind of stops running and I can go fix my code. And this should really help uh, beginners learning to code. And co-code sessions where one person in the room accidentally drops a little code bomb, it'll catch those. Okay, so that's super useful for teaching. Maybe I take a quick look at some of the new demos that are available. I'm gonna to scroll to the very bottom. Uh, with every release, it's really fun introducing some new demos. This is something that's just gonna grow and grow with kind of two focuses for the demos. Uh, it's either demonstrating something that's like 
has to work in a unique way within P5 Live. So if you're loading a library like Voronoi, uh, it just demonstrates, hey, this is how you import external libraries within P5 Live. You just say let libs equal, and then you can pass remote libs or local if it can't find the remote one. And this got cleaned up as well uh, in the latest version. So now it's much better at finding this file before it would like break if you had a space there or didn't have a space there. But yeah, so the libraries are are either about, the demos rather, are about demonstrating how something works slightly differently inside of P5 Live for like a an external asset, or it's focused towards what could be interesting things for VJane, because uh, that was a big initial point of this. And so it's like playing with audio. I probably shouldn't press this because I doubt it's going to react Never mind. Cool. It's reacting to this audio right now, I guess. Uh, yeah, to demonstrate how you can possibly play with audio and all the interesting things you can do. I think it's pretty quiet right now. I'm going to say times 10. There we go. Now we can see the audio reaction. So most of the demos are kind of focused on VJ use or use inside of this P5 Live environment. But there's a couple new uh, demos that are kind of sharing special ways of using P5 Live, especially this canvas, because once in a while it might be nice, uh, by default, all the canvas sketches, especially when you say you want a new sketch, by default, it makes it a full screen window because it says, hey, we're VJane. We're going to hide the code. We're going to hide the menu and do stuff on the screen. But maybe you just want to use this P5 Live environment that works really fast. It's live coding to make a sticker, for example. And maybe the sticker should be like exactly 300 by 300 or something. Uh, so this is a new demo to show you how we can force this window resize to ignore changes to the browser. And you can work in a small way. So a recommendation, making a small canvas, putting it in the center, setting an initial background color, and then setting your background color afterwards. So yeah, check out these demos. The opposite of a small making a poster. This is useful as well for students who want to work on a print basis within P5 uh, using a, a layer that's much bigger than the screen, showing it smaller. Or something that's kind of fun is embedding anything. Um, this is pretty wild that we can also, this was a hack, um, that I figured out while doing a co-coding session last year and we can take advantage of these DOM aspects of P5 and we can embed anything. So this is just an example to embed a YouTube video. And so you could put any other URL there, or you could just put any other website there, um, this particular example is designed and ready for for entering a video with special URL params, but technically any URL should work there when you tweak the example. I'll come back to the chalkboard. I'm holding off for that for last. Um, what else happened? Cleaned up the typo ones a little bit. The hardware now has an example for serial connections uh, for hooking up to an Arduino or so. A few weeks ago in this remote teaching, we ended up in a workshop with Fallblot, um, something to look up, fallblot.ch. Uh, we were able to talk in co-coding remotely from our houses to old flipping uh, SBB train signage that flips from a connection coming into it. And it was pretty wild that... Um, yeah, one person had to have the serial app open and everyone else could adjust the code and it made it possible to remotely control hardware from our browsers. It was pretty wild in a collaborative way. But the really big fun new territory is shaders. I am a total noob at shaders. Uh, it's crazy, crazy math and crazy, crazy... Yeah, commands, geometry, uh, but it is so, so cool for how smooth this whole domain can work. And so now there are a few demos to get you started in shaders. 
uh, including here is a, a collaborative work initiated from Alan Bruch, part of his uh, master's thesis last year working on shaders and was specifically playing in P5 Live to write shaders and um, yeah, found this whole workflow where we could describe the shader as a variable inside of P5 Live instead of normally it's a text file that you would reference. Uh, but we can also just describe that text inside of P5 Live and then it makes it possible to live code these shaders. Not quite as smooth as something like Shader Toy, but in a really similar way. So I've added a couple fun demos. This is a material capture demo um, borrowed from these great examples from Adam Ferris. And then I have one example showing using it as a texture on 3D objects. So maybe you know how to do a shader or you find a shader and you want to apply it to the geometry. And this gives you yeah, the, the starting point for that, trying to make it as simple as possible to build off of. Or you might want to go out to Shader Toy where all the really fun shaders are. And this is a template to try and help make it a little bit easier after a bunch of frustration. Um, how to borrow and remix shaders from Shader Toy. So essentially, there is a part where you should start the Shader Toy and you should paste it in, end the Shader Toy, and then it's about going through and fixing the uniforms and, and details that are needed. Um, but of course, it opens up all kinds of new possibilities for creative code where it maybe before had kind of a, um, yeah, a certain aesthetic quality based on the render of the WebGL or the the 2D render, but all of a sudden, because you're working with the graphics card, crazy blurs and tilt shift and um, effects are possible where you can also push them in super weird domains to make interesting uh, broken geometry. So something kind of fun is maybe I'll just quickly, all of these things, um, Whenever you work with the demos and you start to type inside of the demo, it automatically creates a clone of the demo so that it doesn't screw up the demo. It's like works as a template. So I could say text3d, I'm going to make another thing. Text3d is a create graphics. That's my width, height, and it's going to be a WebGL. Uh, maybe I'll say text, whoops. Text3D also has a background. Uh, let's finish that Text3D. And I'm gonna turn off some of this other stuff, but I'm just gonna draw text3d.reset, uh, text3d.background is black, and I'm gonna draw a 3D shape on there. Dot box is maybe 200. And then the way all of these were built was really with the idea of passing a texture into them. Uh, that way you don't have to go too far into the shaders. You can, of course, you can do all kinds of manipulation, but it can be really nice just to have an idea of how can you take what you already know how to do with P5 into a shader. So I'm actually gonna say text3d.nofill and text3d.a white stroke. Okay and I'll make this thing bigger. Yeah, so now I'm passing a 3D object as a texture into this particular sort of tilt shift like shader. And then it's maybe nice to say text 3D dot rotate Y radians frame count and get that thing spinning around or even uh, maybe orbit control would be nice. Let me do a X divided by three. Uh, maybe the stroke weight needs to be thicker so we can see it a little better. Whoa, not so thick, there we go. Yeah, so what's really interesting as well is how you can use these shaders to like burst the geometry apart. So it can be kind of effect and it can be huge manipulation, but these are things that you just, uh, I don't think you could do in another way. So you kind of get to yeah, explore shader domain and work in P5 domain where I'm much more comfortable, but hopefully these demos can help um, yeah, get you started 
messing with shaders. Okay, I think, yeah, there's all kinds of little nitty gritty things that if you're really interested, you can learn about on GitHub. But the main new feature I wanted to share is this thing called the chalkboard. So I'm gonna make a new sketch to give my fan a break. And this was definitely inspired by watching coding train videos um, where a chalkboard is used all the time to explain things. I mean, that's a, a typical thing, especially in mathematics um, and other subjects to, to sort of work an idea out with a pen. And I use this all the time. I was, I was always having to, uh, what I would normally do is say like, uh, no background actually, I would say stroke 255. Um, let's make a line that goes from mouse X to mouse Y, P mouse X to P mouse Y, if mouse is pressed and stroke weight four. So like this, I have like the world's crappiest little drawing program and this would be super useful for like explaining things like a map function, which I always say it's kind of like a funnel. It comes down and you feed a number into it, it has a range and you want a new range to come out like minus five to five. Um, yeah, as visual ways to try and explain this stuff. The coding train does an awesome job of, of doing this parallel to showing the code. So, that led to the idea that, hey, maybe we need something like this built into P5 instead of always having to write this little snippet of code to make a drawing. And then what happens if I actually wanted to use this to like highlight the code and say, that's the area right there you should be looking at. So that led to chalkboard, something built into this. And what it is, it starts out looking kind of like a pool table and what we can do is uh, we can use it as a great explanation drawing space. So I can set the weight of my pen, if it should be a thick marker, what's the opacity of it. These things are working like layers. So uh, yeah, let me show you a couple of things. So I can play with the weight, I could draw really fine lines I could draw thicker lines. I could change the color and say, I want white lines. Or I want uh, orange lines. So I can draw and use this to explain things because I'm also using it all the time to explain like how does a sine wave work? And it's like those points along a positive one or maybe minus one positive one. Do, 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 do. Uh, yeah, so you can change color, which can be really nice to like uh, explain different things. Maybe the dots need to be a different color. But then what gets really interesting is we can hide the background so we can see the code still along with these chalkboards. So you could either use it like, hey, I want to explain something to you. Control B, I hide it, and now we explain and do this thing. So maybe I get rid of this and I say, hey, I have an ellipse that's in the center of the page, it is 200. And it's gonna be plus a sine wave. Uh, we need a background. So I could demonstrate what a sine wave is and then I could have my chalkboard kind of explaining how this thing is working, that we're feeding a number into the sine function. So the chalkboard stay there. Um, even when you change sketches, I can go to another sketch, I can go back to our shader and press Control B and it's still there. It only goes away when you completely refresh the browser. So it can be really helpful to explain something and maybe demonstrate it multiple times and keep coming back to your slide. The other thing we could use it for is highlighting code. So I can control how much I see the background or not of my sketch. We also have up to 10 drawings here that we can store. So I can go to sketch number uh, two. I could hide the opacity and I could uh, also make the opacity of my sketch a little light, make this wide and I could say, hey, this is the really important part or better yet, this is the really important part. This times 0.1 
is the speed at which this thing is moving. So maybe that's what you should really play with. So then I could go there and say, oh yeah? And now it's going crazy fast or a little slower. And you could just use it to sort of highlight where the fun parts are and say like, that is about the speed. Speed. And maybe use a different color, like an orange that's really wide and say, this part here is about the distance. Distance. I maybe should add like a typewriter feature because my writing handwriting is not so good here. So then I could change that value and say, aha, now it can go even further, 400 in each direction. Yeah, so it could be useful as, as like, or if I put the opacity way up, I can also censor stuff. Maybe if you want to block out some code. Yeah, so you could use it as a highlighter. You could use it as a demonstration. You can have multiple slides. Uh, you can save them. So I click save. It just downloaded it to my downloads. So you could always reference it later in a note. Uh, it's a transparent background. As you saw, I could hide the background. So what it ends up saving is a PNG without a background. So you can always overlay this on some other teaching material or so. So that could be useful. And what gets super trippy is the fact that these are available to us in the sketch. So basically what we're doing in this, this chalkboard, it's like a mini P5 sketch. That's like a, a crappy little drawing tool uh, sitting full frame on top of our, our whole P5 Live environment. And so that is what a couple of these demos help demonstrate is the fact, let me hide these shader and such, back to canvas. Uh, we can grab these items from the chalkboard sketch and bring them into our sketch. So I'll demonstrate what that does. Let me hide this stuff, hide the chalkboard. Let me actually go to a different, a brand new sketch, a brand new drawing. Uh, and let me hide the chalkboard. So what I'm doing here is I use, uh, we, are, we can go access the chalkboard by saying p5live.chalkboard. And this is an image. It's a, it's a P graphic, essentially. And so we can have it grab the one that we're actually working on. And what I'm doing here is I'm centering things, I'm rotating things. And now if I draw, I get to do some wild mandala um, geometry. You can also press delete to hide it. I could have the opacity way off, but I think it kind of helps to see a little bit of opacity if you're using the image. That way it's really clear when you have the, the chalkboard visible or not. Uh, but let me bring the chalkboard up again. I can clear. And I can, let me make the weight a little thinner. And hide. Yeah, and so basically this is going and grabbing whatever our current active chalkboard is. So I could go back to number zero where I had the sine wave. I could go to one where I had this speed and distance. Or I can go programmically grab any of those. I could say zero and that'll grab the zero out of 10. It's an array. So I can go grab the zero or the one or the two or we can get into animation by automatically grabbing a different one. So this is just an example of grabbing the chalkboard. There is another fun example for this animation, chalkboard animation. And essentially what this is doing is using the frame count to go grab one of those chalkboards. So let me quickly trash my chalkboards. A really quick way to trash them would just be refresh the whole page restart P5 Live, it cleared the buffer of chalkboards that I had. Let me make the weight a little thicker. And when you go and ask for the chalkboard, I limit, I use a modulo 10. So you can never ask for a chalkboard that doesn't exist. It's going to automatically like um, cycle around zero to nine, zero to nine of the chalkboards. So what this lets you do is like I could make uh, I can also use the number keys to swap between these. So I can use my number keys to go like, you'll see up here, I'm changing between drawing four, now five, 
six, seven, eight, nine. I have one left. Nope, I ran out because uh, it starts counting at zero. So now I'm back to zero. So I can hide the chalkboard. I can hide my code. And I can use P5, P5 Live, together with P5 and this chalkboard as a really rudimentary animation system, but with all kinds of weird new possibilities. Because, let me show the code again. I can change the speed of it. So now it goes way faster, double so fast, three times as fast. Interesting, that kind of froze. Oh, because I wanted 0.75, that's why. Or I could slow it way down, and now it's like boop, 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 boop. Uh, of course, this gets interesting when you play with the background, like how much are the things visible? If I barely have a background, then you'd see a single frame at a time, so then this thing should get faster. And now it's going quicker. Uh, this is having the frame count go through them. So if I just let the plain old frame count, this thing goes super fast. It's like whipping through those different chalkboards. We can, of course, grab a random one because we know that uh, the numbers go from zero, that's the very first one, to nine, that's the very last one. So I could just say, give me a random number up to 10. And in the back end, I'm flooring the number and I'm... Uh, protecting it in case you ask for a number that's bigger than nine, it just wraps around. So you don't have to worry about flooring it or anything, and now we can get a random frame out of this animation. If I want it to be not so fast, uh, then I need to like have a little bit of logic waiting for this number and only so often update it. The other thing I could do, let me put this back to like frame count times 0.25. I could use my own modulo. Here I say like modulo three, and then I could have a nice little three frame animation. Or I say I want five frames. So maybe I will go and quickly trash. I'll go back and delete. I can press the delete key, go to three, delete, four, delete, uh, rather four, delete, five, delete, six, delete, seven, delete, eight, delete. I'm starting over. So now there's nothing on my drawings. And now I can make myself a little animation. If I wanna um, see it a bit better, I could say like, doop, doop. I can build a little Ajax loader. Zoop. And hide the, hide the board. And now I have like a five frame animation going through. I could speed it up or slow it down or maybe have more of a background hanging out there. So let this thing like leave a longer trace behind and then the arrow gets to like catch its tail if I make this slow enough. There we go. Now it's kind of a bit like a neon sign kind of charging up. Yeah, so I think I will use, I got about 20 minutes left. Uh, I think it might be fun just to kind of mess around with this chalkboard possibility and kind of have things appear, maybe play with a bit of animation possibility and see what's possible. Because this thing could be used for anything. Like here I'm using it as a picture, but I bet I could use it as a texture on a 3D shape. So let's try some of these things out and see what's possible. I hope I covered everything about chalkboard, mainly intended for instruction, but might open up all kinds of cool animation possibilities to you, or VJ possibilities. Uh, something else that's kind of fun to do is use it in feedback, so maybe I'll get to that. But let me start a new sketch. I don't need to use the template. I am going to delete what I had on my chalkboards. And let's draw some stuff in 3D. So WebGL, let's have a background, whoops. 
And let's draw a sphere that's like 300 big. Boom. Let's say no stroke. And let me quickly put something on the board here. So I'm going to make a much thicker weight. And I'm going to make like a zigzag. And test out if this works. I'm going to say texture p 5 live dot chalkboard. And I'll say zero. And of course it doesn't work because I should have tested this before trying to do such a thing. Uh, let me turn that off for a sec. Get my picture back. Let me test just showing this image again. Image zero zero. Am I doing something wrong? What am I doing wrong? Width is undefined in this environment. Am I grabbing it wrong? This is a super new function, so I am myself quite new at playing with it. But maybe it's because of the environment. This WebGL and not being happy about being used in WebGL. So there is my drawing. Interesting. Maybe it just doesn't like running in WebGL. Aha. I might have played with this back when I was making chalkboard, wanting to do this exact thing and running into trouble. So let me do two things. Let me make a layer. Let's tell this layer to be a create graphics with height. And let me draw this thing on that layer instead. So I'm going to say all the time layer.clear and layer.image. Let's see if this works. And then if I say image layer zero, zero, there it is again. And maybe now I can use it as a texture. Let's see. Now I say, show me the layer. No complaints yet. Yay, there it is. Crazy. So that's like a, a hoop we have to jump through. I don't know why. Aha, you need to put it on a plane. That's an interesting idea as well. Although I really wanted to use it as a texture on any given shape so that now I could say orbit control five and twist this thing around. And I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing maybe this, the P graphic of the chalkboard for whatever reason, maybe once in a while it doesn't give a proper shape so it can't be used as a texture. I'm not sure, but this is an interesting hack that maybe should become a, a demo because then it's nice to say rotate Y, whoops, rotate Y radians. Ah, where's my parenthesis? It's not working. How strange. I must have pressed a special key. There we go. Radians, frame count. But now we lost our chalkboard, so we just have to draw it again. Zigzag, zigzag. Okay. So now this thing is spinning around and we can use our chalkboard as a texture. And then what we could of course do is play with multiple of these things. So maybe I'm going to delete and draw this again and make that as number one. Number two is maybe similar. I could also play with different colors. Number three will be like flat line and then spiky and then flat line. And number four will be a more regular wave. Okay. So I have four of these things. Let me hide this and tell it to go grab one of those things. Let me say frame count times 0.25 modulo five, or maybe even four. And then I can use these uh, chalkboards as an animation, as a texture. That's kind of fun. Or what's it like as a box? Then we get the same thing repeated around the form or as a torus. Uh -huh, that's kind of cool because it flattened it. Let me make the torso a little thicker. 
20 or 40. Yeah, it seems to be wrapping it in kind of a nice way from that drawing. Well, let's let this thing be really thick. That seems a little too slow. Maybe this just needs to be a, a faster rate. Maybe I shouldn't clear the background. Maybe I should give the layer a, a background that is fading. 50 or 30. So we get also some of this faded quality, uh, but then we can't see through the thing, unfortunately. Yeah, but all kinds of possibilities. Um, so this is like a 3D example messing with 3D. Let me make another example. Let me go to my chalkboards and delete them. I'm gonna clear the buffer of all of those and go to the first one and just draw like a little person. Uh, let's try that again. It's gonna be a horrible drawing. Two, let's have a person that kind of walks along. And maybe they trip over something right there. There's a reason why I like to code, because my mouse drawing skills are not so hot. Uh, we have two more frames left. Oh, what could also be interesting is to see the animation I'm manually flipping through them, but I could also use code to help me see these things. So maybe I say I have a background that's zero and 15, and let's draw these pictures. Image p5live.chalkboard frame count times 0.25 zero, zero. There we go. Now I can see the things kind of going by. I could decide how quickly I want to see them. Maybe if I make it really fast, then I could see the things even better. If I make this, I could get kind of stroby, but actually I like this onion skinning. So I don't need it to move too fast, so long as the background sits there for a while. And now I can finish and draw, uh, I think I was on number seven or number eight. Number eight. And maybe here they do a cool handstand. And on number nine, uh, I don't know what they do. They do like a one-handed wave to us. Okay, maybe I need a rock in there that suddenly appears. So I'm gonna change the color to gray and pick one of these frames to have the rock appear. So maybe it wasn't always there, whoops. Maybe it suddenly appeared. Ooh, I just was clicking something. I'm gonna to have to clear this layer. So let's start this over and go right there. Interesting. Somehow this was pressing the key while I was getting ready to mess with this. It's actually going to repeat a couple of these. Okay, now we're missing some frames. Yep, this is a silly animation. I'm probably wasting my time trying to make this even better. Uh, let's go to the next frame, they were walking along. I can even trace what was already there in the background. Interesting, I still have a little ghostly picture of it. And then they already started to fall and trip over the thing and went ah. And I think one more frame and then this is good. Okay. Hide that thing. There we go. Bloop, bloop. Amazing. A schadenfreude animation with the chalkboard. And then we can play with how fast or slow this thing goes. Whoops. 
Ah, oh, interesting. I think I'm accidentally pressing a key on my keyboard. There we go. I'm accidentally pressing insert, which is screwing up the way Ace Editor works. So I can speed the thing up. Zip, zip, zip. Slow it down. If I want, I could look at just a couple frames. Whoops. Modulo 5. We could look at the moment of impact with that rock. Playing with the jog wheel. Where we let the whole thing go. Yeah, it can also be interesting to uh, play with feedback with this. It's fun to make feedback on everything. So let's add a little bit of feedback to our layer and say, let F be. And what's interesting is I can recompile, recompile, and luckily the chalkboard is staying there with its history until I refresh the page. So hopefully I don't have to refresh the page at any point. Uh, but I'm going to say this equals create graphics with a width and a height. And just make FB equal get from 0, 0 to width height for, whoops, for just taking a picture of what I'm drawing all the time. I love using get for a feedback. And now let's play it back and say let scale equal 1.0 to start. Show me that feedback. And this is maybe a good moment to switch to center image mode in case I wanted to do some rotation. Image mode center, which throws this thing off. So I just have to say width divided by two, height divided by two, there we go. And let's do the same here, width divided by two, height divided by two. And say width times scale, height times scale. Okay, we should be having visual feedback already. So I can play with the scale and say, get a little bigger, and there we go. This would probably be a lot cooler if I was just making abstract animations with my chalkboard rather than this goofy thing. But maybe it's good to start goofy and then try to make it um, purposeful. So this is the opposite. Now I'm zooming out, making the scale less than zero so it fades away i can adjust how quickly that fades away so maybe there's that's creating a kind of nice like stagger going off in the distance ever so slightly i could also play with the height of these things minus five for example whoa too much minus two minus three Yeah, maybe minus 30. What does that look like? Choo, choo, choo. Minus 10. Let's leave it at 10. Now we have quasi 3D shapes flying away. Minus 1, maybe just for a little bit of texture. Or plus 1. Going downward. Yeah, with just a couple lines of code, we can suddenly turn this little animation player into way different things. Uh, feedback being one way to manipulate this thing. Rotation being another. That's really fun. I was playing with it before. With that other demo, to do a rotation, I should push and pop myself to that point. So I should say push, uh, translate to that point. Let's pop and then draw in zero, zero land. So now it's the exact same. But now I can rotate around the center. So I could say rotate radians frame count divided by two way too fast let's actually um no let's just do times 0 0.01 0 0.02 0 0.01 0 0.01 there we go have to slow it way way down Maybe even more, just to get like a slight twist going back there. Or take advantage of this thing spinning a whole lot and giving us kind of this kaleidoscopy like effect where then it can be nice to figure out, um, yeah, what is the right relationship for this to be? If I go positive numbers, 
you eventually hit some some sweet spots. At 45, 46, yeah, 45. Okay, let me try this, and in our last seconds here, let's change this up and get rid of this little animation we had. Let me go quickly through all my canvases and delete, 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 and start back at the very first one, maybe with a really light weight, full opacity if we're not already, and just try to draw something, kind of a random form. Whoops. And let me go to the next form. And draw something else. Yeah, actually, I think it's nice to temporarily turn off the cycling through all of these things. I'm going to stick to just a single frame so I can slowly work out what am I even doing on that first frame. So I'm going to say delete, delete. And maybe I just draw something small and go to the next frame and draw something further and go to the next frame and draw something else. Whoops. And try to make this like a little animation that's finding its way back to the starting point. Okay, we're on. Oh no, we were already on the first one. Oh well, let's just connect the lines and see if this works. Go back to 10. Yay, and now it's sort of walking these lines and going through those different steps of animation. And I'm going to speed it up so it's more fluid. I wonder if I can go in negative. Nope, I can't go negative. I can give a little bit less opacity. Yeah, better with with more opacity so it leaves more of a trail. I think I could actually reverse it by saying 10 minus this. There we go. Now I can swap it. Yep, and then it could be fun just to go through and play with each layer and add different coloring and, I don't know, tweak that thing and get more and more stuff happening. All right, now it looks like one of those uh, one-way mirror installations that create an infinite zone. Yep, I hope you had fun checking out the latest features of P5 Live. Uh, it's waiting for you at p5live.org. You can download it, run it offline, co-code with one another. I'll try to get into doing some co-coding for the P5 Live sessions for anyone who's out there who wants to code with uh, this live setup. We'll get into that. And yeah, happy holidays. Have a nice coming into the new year. See you all a week from now, next Tuesday, 9 p.m. Central European time. Thanks for watching.